Too late. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, welcome to uh, our talk on Lionel Wentz, Ceylon, Timeless Affiliations, with Dr. Edwin Komisaru and Kathy Machado. Um, the Sri Lankan photographer Lionel Wendt, from, uh, who was 1900 to 1944, is a starting point for the curatorial rationale of the exhibition Pivot, Glide, Echo and Colour, and can be seen as a turning point towards the contemporary in both Sri Lanka and for its diaspora. This conversation between Kathy Machado and Dr. Edwin Commissaro is an exciting moment to bring Lionel Wentz into the contemporary imagination through novel interpretations and personal affiliations. I'm going to start by reading the bios of Kathy and Edwin. So first of all, no order, <laughs> Kathy Machado. Kathy is a British Sri Lankan artist photographer who works with the themes of identity, time and memory. Her current body of work explores the lensing of post-colonialism, diasporic identity, and cross-cultural encounters through the work of photographer Lionel Wendt. Cassie studied English literature at King's College London and was awarded the Foundation Botin Award by the photographer Paul Graham in 2011. She has exhibited at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art Sri Lanka 2020, Mocha Te Taipei 2019, Dhaka Art Summit 2018, Colombo Art Biennial, 2016 and Sasia Fernando Gallery 2016. Over to Edwin. Dr. Edwin Kamasaru is a historian of modern and contemporary British and Sri Lankan art. His research considers the politics of gender, sexuality, and race. Kamasaru is an editor of the journal Visual Culture in Britain. He has been awarded postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Edinburgh, the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art, and the Courtauld Institute of Art, where he earned his PhD and co convened the His the Gender and Sexuality Research Group. He previously worked as a research assistant on the Association of Art History's Anti-Racist and Decolonial Resource Portal, formerly a contributing editor of British Art Studies. Commissario has also co-edited a book on imaginary apocalypse, sorry, <laughs> art and the end times, Courtauld Books Online 2022. He has written articles and book reviews for peer-reviewed journals, Art History, Third Text, The Irish Review, Irish Studies Review, Oxford Art Journal, alongside exhibitions, essays for museums and galleries, Barbican Centre, Autograph, Javeri Contemporary, Saskia Fernanda Gallery, Belfast Exposed, Town Hall Coven. Lots of, <laughs> lots of amazing accomplishments to both of your names. Um, so I thought would be a really good place to start. We're in the Lionel Went Centre, and the exhibition obviously is starting on Lionel Went. I thought you could both maybe give me a little bit about who was Lionel Went and what is his place in Sri Lanka's cultural landscape and history. Do you want to start? <laughs> I'd like to start by saying thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in conversation this morning and, and to share this time and space with all of you. Obviously, you will all already be familiar with Lionel but I think it's helpful to recap his story because it will set up our conversation a so, Lionel Wentz represented a profound contribution to Sri Lankan culture and life. As Marla said, born in 1900 and died in 1944, he never lived to see independence four years later, but he contributed to a whole kind of aesthetic movements in the early 20th century that championed Sri Lankan culture, the arts. He was a curator. He co-founded the 43 Green. He created a photography studio. He wrote a prolific amounts about photography, art criticism. I think he had a real convening power and he really brought together thinkers, artists, creators. Obviously this building and institution is part of his legacy and Carla is, is drawing on that connection. But I think he was also an artist who was kind of in and out of place as well. As you're already familiar with, he was half Singhalese, half burger and also moved through and circulated in larger imperial networks 
So he spent time living in London from 1919 to 1924. Engaged with a lot of European arts and culture, which he would um, ship back here and he'd champion the, the exhibiting. And so he's often, um, he often doesn't fall into neat binary categories. He's, I think, hard to place in, in, um, in a kind of neat story or neat history. And his, his vision of the island was one that's, you know, very generous, abundant. It was both of its time and it also imagined a Sri Lanka to come, and perhaps a Sri Lanka that is still yet to come as well. So I kind of, I, I figure that I think speaks to the decade. Uh, as, as, you know, this, you know, program demonstrates. Um, well, yeah, I think um, Edwin said that really beautifully. Um, I was just going to say, all to say that, you know, I think when we're talking about um, who went was and his identity, um, you know, I think his identity and that exploration was really at the centre of his work. And actually, um, oh no, it's gone. Um, there's an image before that was called Untidy, Untidy Work Desk. Um, which is an image of his desk, um, which really there's a picture of him, a portrait, a self-portrait of him in the top left-hand corner um, with objects um, that he photographed. Um, yeah, a, a, a mask. Um, the, I forget what that, the name of the image is that's at the back. Um, but yeah, one of his famous photographs, um, one of the famous sculptures that appears um, repeatedly and in different motifs in different ways throughout his work, and then obviously his camera and the photographic kind of paraphernalia on the right, um, you know, elements that are kind of part of his dark room. And I think that this, this view into the man, to his desk, this very kind of intimate image, um, really speaks to, you know, these themes, you know, if we analyze these objects and where they came from, their Provence and, you know, what they meant to his work and the fact that he situates himself uh, in conversation with all these objects, you know, he's directly kind of positioning his identity in conversation with his work. So yeah, I think that's really the themes that we're interested in exploring today and also the themes that um, more personally I've been exploring and also Edwin also explores personally with his work also. So yeah, I think that's enough of an intro. <laughs> Do you want to add anything more? Are you ready? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you both for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, speaking of the personal um, identity, it'd be lovely to know how you both came to Went and what are your personal connections, what draws you to re-engage with his work constantly? <laughs> Too much talk. <laughs> so I'm a, a very distant relative of Philander Went. My uh, grandmother was Went. And I'm also a um, mixed race. So I think there's something about um, there's something about that personal connection that is very interesting and complex to write about and with, because there's a certain level of investment and, and connection or, or a stake in its cultural legacy and imagination. But I think the, the other thing about being mixed race is that profound sense of not quite fitting in anywhere. Um, always being, or, you know, I grew up feeling, I suppose, between a binary in a world of police binaries at all times and places, but with a real sense that I was a problem. It was the structure that produced that kind of violence. And I think in Went, I can feel, you know, on the one hand, there's that real commitment to Sri Lankan identity, culture. Um, I, I think absolutely it was an, a kind of anti-colonial aesthetic that he created and crafted. But I think he's also very resistant to forms of neat categorization as well. He's always trying to undermine, disrupt, exceed and seep or slip between neat categories. And I think there's something in that that, uh, that spoke to me in a very 
deeply. Um, so yeah, very much, I mean, in a sense, you know, me and, and Wen and Edwin and Marla, you know, we <laughs> share um, this sense of, you know, being from multiple places and the experience of kind of growing up within structures that didn't necessarily suit us. Um, but all to say, that I think, you know, it's, all, it's not a bad thing, it's a positive thing because we can also be from many places and we have this great privilege to connect and be able to inhabit and um, experience different cultures. Um, and, you know, I think like Lionel, this maybe enables us to see and connect with the world and, and others in a different way. Um, I connected kind of with Lionel on this kind of thematic and kind of personal journey. Um, it was really something kind of growing up that was very troubling and very difficult to, to talk about and really kind of express. And I guess I started really thinking about it um, in COVID actually. And I think kind of knowing, you know, other people in the diaspora, um, I think, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement was quite a, a catalyst moment kind of for this. And I know many people I've spoken to have said the same thing, where we kind of began thinking about our own identities and our relationship to, um, to our identities, to colonial structures that we live within um, and the problematics that kind of come with all those things. And I think that kind of questioning of identity is very much, it goes on from the Black Lives Matter movement. It's, just, it's not just that, it's also just the moment in time that we find ourselves in today. Um, you know, I mean, all these things relate to this subject matter, the Ariagala, you know, Brexit. Um, I think these things are constantly things that more and more people are thinking about and we're questioning. And I think for me, that's really what kind of post-colonialism means. It's sort of a, a questioning of those structures and sort of ideas that we were given and sort of taught that these were the right things and this was the way you should learn it and just sort of re-questioning those and unbundling them and almost like a ball of wool, like untying and unpicking and reconfiguring. And I think, you know, very much like Wendt's work in the lead up to independence, you know, these themes were very much relevant to him. And that's, I think, what we're talking about, right? That he kind of transcends time and becomes sort of relevant and relevant again. There's this great quote, quote that we were talking about, the Kumaraswamy quote, remembering and remembering again and again that we think is you know, very relevant to, to Wendt's work. Um, hang on, what was I? What was I? I've sort of lost what I was saying now. <laughs> You're on Kumaswari, Swami. Ah, oh, yeah, I was talking about Kumaswari. Kumaras, um, Kumaraswami. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this is really kind of how the conversations around my own identity sort of came up for me. And then obviously, as a Sri Lankan photographer, um, you know, I've always known about Wendt's work. Um, but, you know, Wendt kind of gets talked about, largely speaking, you know, in two ways, either, you know, gender and sexuality or as a surrealist. Um, and I hadn't really sort of delved kind of further into his work, you know, beyond that and, and appreciating it. Um, but as these themes kind of came up for me, I just sort of started re-looking at his work. And uh, I just thought, I actually think there's more to this then kind of meets the eye. So yeah, I just started reading and kind of researching as I do as much as, you know, I could get my hands on. Um, it was about Lionel. Um, there's not a huge amount of stuff written about him and, you know, it takes some searching. Um, you know, his archive as well is, is an unstable archive as we've spoken about. And, um, you know, it's incomplete, so it sort of makes it wonderful because it's also open to interpretation. And so anyway, I started um, doing all this research on Lionel. And, you know, as time went on and I, I continued with the research, I really felt that, you know, it's really important to look at Lionel in the context of the time he was working, which was in the lead up to Sri Lankan independence. And for me, you know, I think talking about him through the lensing of kind of sexuality or gender or surrealism is really minimalizing his endeavor. And, you know, Sonal Kula talks about that in her essay, Worldly Affiliations. And for me, you know, his work was a kind of reworlding project. You know, it was about reinvention, reimagination and rebirth. He was trying to imagine 
um, a new vision for Sri Lankan ident identity in the lead up to independence that obviously, as you we were saying, happened before, be um, after he passed away. Um, but it's, it's interesting because when you look back at his work from the present day, perhaps, you know, it doesn't look that revolutionary, but compared to, when we compare it to the kind of photographs and the way that Sri Lankans and Sri Lanka was depicted before, and, you know, it's interesting we should talk about you know, the relationship of when, because it is important to look back to the birth of photography and the relationship that had with colonialism. Um, but, you know, his work was so revolutionary. And I think, you know, through this process of making these pieces um, for Carla, which are part of a, of a larger, much larger project, um, I got to play a lot in the darkroom with um, a technique called the photogram, which, which Lionel played with. And I think really through, I mean, I've always um, worked in analog and in the darkroom, but it just really made me be, wow, like it's amazing that he was making these works at the time and place that he was, what he was making them in. But yes, that's how, that's how I got to line up. <laughs> and also to Edwin also. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go back to a point that you brought up, you defined what post-colonialism or post, the term post-colonial means to you. And we often use these terms quite liberally. Um, so I'd love to ask you both, I know that also, sorry, backtracking, that Edwin uses the term abundance in his recent essay. And I think before we delve into using that term all the time in what we're talking about, it'd be really helpful if you could both just kind of, I mean, you've already defined post-colonial to you, but what do those terms, post-colonial and abundance, mean to you both, and um, how do you bring them into your research and approaches towards Lionel Wentz's work? Should I start with abundance? Yeah. Thank you, that's a great question. I took the concept of abundance from Sri Lankan folklore, but it's also an idea that's becoming very popular in decolonial theory, recent um, ecological writings. And I suppose there are two strands. One is an environmental idea that we already have enough resources they just need to be redistributed. And one of the one of the things that you know British colonialism in particular did to Sri Lanka was narrate the island as abundant in order to manufacture scarcity. But Sri Lanka had its own ecological histories and ways of relating to the environment that often involved common land or spiritually invested ideas of nature that the British try to destroy, suppress. And I think in Lionel Wendt's work there is, he's tapping into that longer cultural history, including the 1950 book, Ceylon, which was published posthumously. There is a vision of the island as full of these abundant landscapes that are invested in these vital forces that kind of animated with spiritual understandings. Although you know, none of them are ethnically exclusive, it's a very generous and open interpretation of Sri Lanka. And that's the other aspect of abundance, is particularly drawing from gender and sexuality studies, it has an identity category or a way of thinking about identity that's not the opposite of scarcity or exclusivity, which is, in a way, race, race was invented by European botanists in the 18th century and, and was always a, a kind of environmental way of thinking, of categorizing people, of sorting them, and organizing them around inheritance. And it is, perhaps a, a logic that's underpinned by a certain kind of scarcity of who belongs and who doesn't belong and, and trying to draw lines and pit people against each other. And, and a, an abundant way of thinking about identity is not necessarily the opposite because it would still be defined in, in the shadow of that. But it, it's this kind of 
generous openness where people can, you know, belong and inhabit multiple overlapping identities in a very poetic and complex way. We've, we've spoken about um, sexuality studies and went, he, he's often considered a queer artist. And I think that was also part of the, um, the abundant thinking it is is resistant to resistance to neat identity categories, which I think draws on that queer aesthetic practice as well. But it's um, the other, in recent writing about abundance, the other characteristics that are described by theorists and scholars also resonate with Wendt's work, which is a kind of playfulness, sometimes in fiction, staging things, a kind of anti-naturalism. The thing about Wendt's practice is he's often bringing you into the making process. I mean, some of the photographs are polished, finished landscapes, and sometimes he's trying to disrupt and, uh, and reveal the ways in which he's constructed those images himself. So there is a kind of, there's a kind of fictional playfulness, a humour, but also a kind of generosity of spirit of um, admitting anyone into this uh, possibility of belonging or being a part of something, which relates to the kind of convening power I mentioned at the start, that he really was keen to bring people together and welcome them, which is, I guess, part of the spirit of this exhibition programme, you know, that we're, we're all being gathered today. Um, I'm, I was thinking maybe we could talk about post-colonialism photography just briefly. Um, so it's interesting looking at um, the role of the camera um, in colonialism. So the camera was actually sort of a, a weapon um, sort of brought by the colonizers to document and to document the different you know, ethnicities um, the community that they were visiting in order to understand them and rule them better. So, you know, it's a very a violent history, actually, if you think about the camera in connection to these histories um, and how, how it managed to create these kind of boundaries between people um, and different types of people. Um, it's kind of my understanding from my research that before um, colonization, um, identities, kind of sexuality, gender was more fluid than we understand it today. And then I think that's what I was saying really about my understanding of colonialism or what post colonialism, and sorry, is just again just re understanding these things that we have come to understand as the truth. And you know, photography has a very interesting relationship with what we perceive to be the truth. Um, in many ways, you know, in, in conflicts that play out. Um, but, you know, re-questioning those things that we've been taught and actually, you know, maybe that's not the way things are. And I think this kind of relates to, you know, Edwin's kind of concept or the discussion around post-colonialism and abundance. Because, you know, when we look at nature, um, yeah, nature doesn't distinguish between things in this way, which is... No, I don't want to say, yeah, the natural order of things, that was like a Darwin thing, but that's opposite of what we're talking about. But, yeah, I think that, yeah, the concepts of talking about Lionel Wen and abundance and looking at post-colonialism and his work through this lens, lensing of abundance and light, um, these timeless affiliations, right, mm. that are, that, yeah, are more poignant and kind of very poetic. Um, yeah. <laughs> you want to add anything? I mean, I think you put that very eloquently. I suppose the, you know, just to add, you know, very briefly, Sri Lanka had its own distinct histories of uh, gender and sexuality that predated, you know, British colonialism and as part of 
you know, when, when the British um, transformed the island into a plantation economy, destroying a lot of common lands, you know, as I described earlier, they also, in the 1880s, outlawed homosexuality as being against the order of nature. And so, colonial rule tried to produce certain ways of thinking about the land, the environment, gender, sexuality, identity, race, ethnicity. They were all parts of the technologies of governance. And I think Lionel Bennett would have been very alive to those histories and their, their implications. But I think his practice was also trying to tap into those deeper Sri Lankan histories that predated colonialism. He was looking back and he was looking forward as well. And that's part of the way that time operates in a very complex way in his work. And clearly his practice continues to resonate today, across decades. But I think he was also trying to refuse, challenge and reimagine the very terms under which I guess he would have been brought up with a certain set of assumptions and, and offer a completely different vision for what Sri Lanka could look like. And, and you used the term world building, uh, which I thought was very beautiful. And, and I think it is a world building project with really profound implications that continue to resonate today. I was thinking maybe it would be interesting to talk about um, the egg. I love the way that, that you talk about that piece. Maybe if we can go to that slide, if that's okay. I think it's the first one. It's the first one. I think, yeah, that's, yeah. So this montage is called Gay Abandon. And it depicts an egg spinning, hovering, as though gravity has begun to distort around it. Collaged on top of a series of rock arches and a beach with a European 19th century sending ship on the horizon, a kind of haunting reminder of colonialism as, as part of the frame for the construction of this image. I think when both responded to European surrealism and, you know, as you've said, innovated it in, in so many complex, profound ways, it, the surrealists in Paris were a group that, that had a very complex, and sometimes contradictory politics when it comes to empire. They often um, engaged in the, with a lot of primitivist tropes. But they also describe themselves as um, anti-imperialists. And I, I, I think he would have understood the implications of engaging this visual language at the time. But I think there's this immense breadth and range in his work from documentary style images to these more imaginative compositions. And I think he had this immense capacity to dissemble and rebuild the world and draw your attention to its strangeness and the possibilities for reimagining it through the process. You know, I think that would be Bringing on um, the idea of not bringing on, but talking about the idea of strangeness, and also bringing back the point that you brought up about light. Um, something we spoke about um, when we were preparing for this was how he engaged with the politics of light and the politics of white. And I know you've t covered this a little bit about race, but how um, how do you, how does this engagement with the politics of light and white as a photographer? Um, relate to these eco ecological um, approaches that you've been looking at, post-colonial approaches, and, and I'll let you answer about your process about working with the camera and how these politics come into that very rambly question. I hope it made sense. <laughs> um, I think we might have to take the question apart. A yes, bit. please do. <laughs> um, but um, I think 
I don't know if this is, this is not really necessary to answer to that question. Um, but kind of picking up on some of the questions that are part of that. Um, I think when I, my process is, it tends to be, I sort of have a question that I'm trying to answer to begin with, um, and something I'm, I'm trying to create an answer to. And one of the things that I was thinking about, which kind of relates to light and how it has helped answer my question, is, um, you know, when I was, thinking about post-colonialism, I was thinking a lot about this kind of idea of the doubling, the double, and the kind of double, doubling of identity um, that, you know, Franz Fanon writes about very eloquently in his beautiful book, um, Black Skin, White Mask, you know, Stuart Hall. These authors made me cry when I was reading them because I just couldn't believe that someone had, had understood this sense of what it could feel like to have this kind of double identity. And he talks about um, the experience of, of, you know, of the black American population and different um, African populations around the world and understanding themselves as a double in the sense of seeing, seeing that they are seen differently through the eyes of the white gaze. Um, and so then, in that sense, they have this sense of double identity. Did that make sense? Um, and so, kind of going back to, you know, what we were talking about, the camera is this kind of weapon. So, what I was trying to essentially do is to obliterate this other, where this kind of double doesn't exist, where there is this more kind of generous depiction or connection with this kind of idea of identity, our true selves. Um, and I really struggle because, because of my camera. And um, so I decided to get rid of my camera and I decided to work with light, um, work, work, work with light instead. I don't know, maybe we should talk about, um, we were talking about you know, heteronormativity and, but anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm gonna stick with this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for this, I decided, and why this came up as a solution was, because as I said, I was struggling to figure out how to do this. And it's definitely not by no means the only solution. You know, different artists have played with these themes and have, have managed to come to different conclusions in their own ways. But anyway, for this, um, I suddenly thought of photograms, which is, um, you know, what these works are. They're photograms. And this is, again, like I said, it's something, a technique that Lionel used. So I don't normally come to using something that's just purely aesthetic because I think it's pretty. It's because, A, it's answering this question, but in the context of Lionel, of course, because this body of work is a kind of fantasy collaboration between myself and Lionel, um, you know, I have to be faithful and to Lionel in certain ways as well. And in that sense, you know, he is very much kind of part of this project. And so I thought, wonderful, you know, he used photograms, like, I can, I can use this. Um, but yeah, so the photogram, for those that don't know, is a cameraless type of photography. So I wasn't using the camera for this. So I felt quite, quite liberated, actually, from these things that we've been talking about. And it kind of works by, maybe we could actually look at the Lionel's photogram, just to begin with. If you go upwards in the slide deck, um, keep going. Yes, this is a photogram that Lionel made. It's a, a triple exposure um, photogram. And how you make them, in essence, is if you imagine what a photographer's dark room looks like, it's be like this room, but with like no lights in. So you kind of actually turn the room itself into a camera. And kind of within that room, you know, there's certain elements that as a photographer, you know, I'm able to play with. Um, so I have my, you know, light sensitive photographic paper. I have my subject and I have my light source which acts like the sun would do um, in relationship to a normal camera and to um, a negative slide. Actually, we talk, should talk about negative slides also and the doubling thing that happens. Um, but in essence, um, I'm working with an enlarger for, for this, which you don't have to use for photograms, but which I decided to because I wanted to depict um, you know, the body in its kind of full form. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's a, it's a dark room. We put the photographic paper on the back wall. The subject, which obviously in this case is the human body, 
um, is placed in front of that photographic paper. And I mean, these pieces, they take about, my pieces take about six hours to make each one. So there's a lot of testing and the colors and how the colors work and how the colors connect also to the theme of light. Um, those things all have to be worked out before and also the, the relationship with the subject. You know, these relationships, the people I, I work with who are in my work are people I've built relationships with over, you know, a long period of time and often are talking about the themes of identity, post-colonialism and doubling of identity, these things. That, and they're often, you know, people who've also experienced these things themselves. So, yeah, it's a product of, of a long period of, of collaboration. Um, and also then the positioning, you know, we talk about the positioning. Um, we talk about the colors, we talk about everything. So all these things kind of go into the kind of the making of this piece. But kind of technically speaking, how this happens. So once we've chosen the rough position in the dark, they go into this position that we've agreed. And then um, using the um, enlarger as a light source, we project light onto them for a certain amount of time. And that time is determined by um, the colors um, and the effects that we want to produce. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, those things are all kind of tested and determined before that image, that moment where we're making that image is made. And then, the, then after that time has elapsed, um, the subject moves away from the paper. And this is all in a, in a dark room, so the, the paper then gets rolled up and kind of gets then put in the, in the developer, developer for the developing process. And then once you're back in the room, the light goes back on and normality resumes. And uh, yeah, then we go out. And actually, if you go up, you can see um, these are just pictures that I took just snaps during the making process in the, the studio, um, the photographic studio that I work with in Paris. And these were just moments after it came out of the dark room. And we got to see the image you know, for the first time. Um, but yeah, it's interesting, kind of, maybe you should follow on about how, or we can ask questions to one another about how these interact with those wider themes and Tamala's wider question. I almost feel like we need to ask it again. Like, um, but yeah, how these have a conversation with kind of light and like kind of images of whiteness. I guess light as a cultural discourse is bound up with lots of other conceptual histories. So there is the association between histories of race and, and, and you know, ideas of light or darkness, as it were. But there's also an environmental history of light in terms of the amount of um, exposure in a climate which can produce particular sets of environmental conditions like heat, humidity. There's something quite distinct about Sri Lanka's own climate that British colonizers were quite anxious about because they were concerned that they were from a temperate region and the tropics um, would have a kind of certain effect on their bodies or will be, which is part of a kind of uh, 19th century way of thinking about the climate as a, uh, as a imperial context and uh, suffused with anxiety about control and mastery as part of the kind of project. So I think it's really interesting that you use light as a, as a medium, given those resonances and those histories. But it's also the thing that European colonialism did was transform landscapes across the world, often uh, destroying them profoundly causing a huge amount of degradation, which has ultimately, in the longer durée of history, culminated in climate change now. So the kind of breakdown 
in our ecosystems on a planetary level is, is the output of these processes. So the amount of light and its distribution on a global scale is also affected by these historical processes. So for you to use it as a, as a medium, as a material, I think is to play with it in quite complex ways. Do you want to say something about the silhouettes and the bodies in your images? Mm. Um, I feel like, like we were saying, I feel like these silhouettes represent um, our true, like our true selves. You know, we were kind of talking about how, um, you know, this kind of the, the relationship of photography to, to colonialism, and I, and just even photography. I think photography sort of creates this distance between the observer or the spectator and the, the subject. And it's almost this kind of, kind of void that is really hard to, to overcome. And you, even though, you know, I think that's interesting, you know, looking at Lionel's work, right, of how close he was able to, to get. And I think some of the issues that trouble Lionel's work and people discuss is this inability that he quite, and I think that's almost why people don't quite, they kind of miss or what they miss or our interpretation of, of his work anyway. Um, and yeah, this, these weren't, I didn't come to this, you know, straight away. I've been kind of testing these ideas over, over the last year or so. We're working with Amash, who's in the audience here, on some really beautiful portraits we did. Um, his, his designs, his work, he's a, a Sri Lankan fashion, fashion designer. And um, you know his work really explores these themes also. But even in those, like I kind of felt like there was still kind of this distance, maybe. Um, and I feel like these they get closer to the real kind of essence. There's this energy that's kind of imbued in them, which you know I can't take full responsibility for. It's this magic you know, kind of happens in the dark room. It's the dark room process. Um, and yeah, playing with light. This playing with this, with this medium, which, you know, we can't control, we can't control light. Like I said, they are very controlled to the extent that I can, but then there's also this, this unexpected element, um, which I think is really beautiful and kind of majestic. And yeah, hopefully when you get to see the work, you haven't. Um, I hope that you feel this when you're standing in front of them. Like for me, but photographs, a good photograph should make, should be a feeling, right? Not, should make you feel something. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> That's a beautiful place to open up the audience to any questions. If you have any, um, any okay. <laughs> I mean, if uh, both of you could talk, <laughs> you have talked for hours. Um, not today, but <laughs> other context. So if there are any questions. Of your work, you know, the time you took it down, um, collaborating with your subjects um, and really thinking through the whole identities between you and your subjects um, and sort of exploring the process together and work together. And maybe, I mean, this is probably a hypothetical, maybe you don't have an answer, but um, just opening up, especially if you went on Sweden, um, what do you think our land's own relationships with these own subjects might have been like? Do you think Maybe there are similar conversations or uh, similar, how uh, um, should I say, thinking through power dynamics because one thing you could potentially sort of like um, speak to with his photographs is that um, there are sometimes very direct uh, class dynamics between who he was and uh, maybe um, where his subjects were from, right? In terms of how some of these photographs are represented um, and how the subjects are. Name or not name, uh, or depicted in certain ways, uh, there are certain things that uh, comes to one's mind. So, um, just maybe thinking through that in terms of this notion of um, post coloniality and uh, thinking about perhaps first line of case in some ways reproducing uh, a form of colonialism um, through, uh, um, shall we say, a, a mediation uh, from the global south. As such, um, so just just opening it up. Uh,
God, I've got a microphone anymore. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. I think, I think it's absolutely true to say that loan awareness work was both implicated in structures and to a certain extent reproduced aspects of them. I mean, particularly Ron Clark's, because obviously he was from very privileged domains. And those dynamics that you described are absolutely a plot in photographs. I can't tell you what the relationship would have been like, but certainly I think pointing out things like, like Nanny is important. I would say that like the titling of his photographs in general are sometimes a bit unstable in that a lot of them are untitled and some of the titles we do have take it to a book which would necessarily have been written. But I think, I think there's, you know, something that, that Hutchton suggested so evocatively was the idea of complicity, which I think is, is true of Wendt's work and very interesting, because I think in many ways he was complicit in certain structures of power, and yet he also crafted or carved up an imaginative space to think beyond or think critically or resist and challenge. And I think both of those things can be true at the same time. I think he's still implicated, you know, via his identity, his position, his relationship with his subjects. But I also think that it doesn't sound... I think he also offers a possibility. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want that to be the sole interpretation because I think that any artist also has the ability to critically engage with their world as well, aesthetically, conceptually, and culturally. And I think he, he offered a space to critically resist and challenge colonial rule as well, even as much as he was still a part of, a part of it. And I think that dynamic is, is a really important tension in his work. I think it's certainly shaped the way he's been read over the decades, but I think it's also part of the difficulty in placing him neatly in a story of Sri Lankan arts. But it's by the same token, the same dynamic by which he continues to speak across the decades because of the contradictions, the tensions, the complications. They're actually profoundly generative, aesthetically, politically, culturally. I was just going to say that you know, um, I think, yeah, Edwin um, said that so beautifully and eloquently, and I, I absolutely agree with, you know, every, everything he said. A conversation about when is isn't a conversation without talking about these subjects. Um, but just to kind of go back to another point that we were making of just it's so important to read when in the time that he was making his work. Um, like, I don't disagree with, with what you said, but I think, you know, you're very much kind of, in a sense, kind of reading it from the present day, you know, who is kind of implicated in almost fostering that kind of idea of, of colonial, co coloniality in relationship to Sri Lankan identity. Again, like if we look back in time before Lionel Wendt was making work, the photographs that were being made in Sri Lanka and how um, these depicted and negotiated and constructed Sri Lankan identities um, you know, again, his work was very revolutionary for that time. Um, and, you know, now we're at a different time, so we're able to make. And that's what's so exciting, I think, about this fantasy collaboration with Lionel. You know, my work is meant to be a, a conversation with him um, and a conversation with all, these, with all these themes, which will continue with the, with the ongoing and larger body of work that I'm working towards. But yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs>
question? Yeah, please do. Could, could um, I ask you, Edward, could, could you put the slide on the uh, screen of the hand on the light? Oh, the let me go do that. <laughs> this one's really interesting because we're talking so about the kind of dark green. Yes. On the light. I think she's just changing it. This, this, mm. this piece here. Yeah. And this piece, as I said, was titled That Should Have Cruised in South. Um, and um, can you talk a little bit about his intention in terms of titling pieces? Um, Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So as I, as I just said, they are, the titles are somewhat unstable in terms of when Sardar in that we don't always know who titled it when and I think that's representative of the archive as a whole being um, somewhat unbounded and there being Images that aren't always entirely catalogued. Uh, that I mean, there, it, there hasn't been a, a kind of exhaustive account on a catalog bed in the street in the down. So we we don't always know which entitled, which were titled later, and, and you know how and why. But nevertheless, I think titles are important. You're absolutely right, and they are evocative. And they do tell stories. And I'm sure, or I would imagine, that he still had some input into you know, at least some of them. Bachelor Cruise and South, I've often thought about that. Yeah. Um, that I, I mean, it, it really, um, it's really evocative. It really, for me, it really jars with this image. For me, it really jars with this image. Like, I just, yeah, I can't sort of accept that as a title. <laughs> because the you know, has totally run yeah. around the title, and it's, but when I look at the piece... <laughs> yeah, that's what museums do, right? <laughs> yeah. But there's probably 15 or 16 lines. I mean, that also kind of leans into, you know, how museums, act, you know, acquisitions and how they work and how they legitimatise those acquisitions, right? Um, yeah, that's another, maybe another conversation. But yeah, for me, it totally jars with this image. Um, the, 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 the title actually says, the image depicts a hand, presumably male, reaching towards an electric light uh, uh, to cover the uh, uh, fascia of the torso. It's intensity. on to say that it's uh, it's a penetration of the total activity of cruising loosely regarded the search to it, as you know, etc. I guess. I suppose there's a real playfulness and a humour to went well. And whoever, whether he created that title or whether it would be someone else, I think he would follow this, um, you know, wonderful and amusing that that, that was cement. Yeah. <laughs> whether or not it, it is a, um, a, a reading that he himself 
down. And I think that's because art and culture. Yeah. We're allowed to make those movies. And, and actually the, that instability in of itself is profoundly crazy because they're leaving waste into the world. Obviously there is no opportunity for a character to what it means for any particular range. But the process of writing art history is, is about storytelling and a craft that, that are always on the stage. And so there is, there is room um, to give those kind of readings, mm. whether or not. Um, I think, I, think there, I, I really understand the tension you described. And, mm. you know, for example, the egg photo montage is called Gay Abandon. And in the 1930s, in Britain, gay would have been slang for homosexual. And it, it, it is, you know, as a queer artist, it, it is quite evocative that that title is associated with that world. Like I said, I assume that he had some kind of input into the topping, because certainly some of those images were exhibited during his lifetime, and he would have absolutely shaped the titling of those. So the mm. ones that you can trace his mm. involvement in. Where it's a bit tricky, I think, is um, works published posthumously or um, works that are, uh, that it's harder to trace uh, that exhibition history. But I think he was a reader of literature and poetry. And I think that there was a rich metaphorical imagination. So whether or not um, that specific title is even there as a description of that image, I do think that words were important to him. And there's a right to as well. And so the titles that he did choose, I'm sure, were purposeful and thoughtfully considered. And probably playful, evocative, and sometimes quite suggestive as well. Thank you. I don't think we have time for any more questions, but I know that Cassie and Edwin will probably be around <laughs> at the centre this morning if you want to keep asking them any questions. And I wanted to thank you both for giving so much time to this conversation. It's been a joy to work with you, and I hope we continue to work together in some capacity. Thank you for everyone for listening today and we look forward to seeing you at the rest of the Colour ASAP talks this week. <laughs>